I'm Charlie Brooker and you're watching Weekly Wipe, a programme about things that are happening. Things like this. Thanks to depressing goings on in North Africa, the world has a new number one bogeyman and it's this guy, Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar, a Bin Laden 2.0 whose cheery face was scarcely off the news. There's also concern about the grim situation in Mali, although if there's one thing we should have learned from Mali, it's that every little thing is going to be alright. A major achievement for Iran's aerospace research, the country has successfully sent a capsule containing a monkey into space. Iran enjoyed heartwarming coverage, improving its international image a hundredfold by strapping a terrified primate to a plank and flinging it at the sun. Absolutely disgraceful. And speaking of disgrace... Hey, hey, are you ready to play? It's time to come and play with the tweeting. There was outrage as the BBC clumsily broadcast an episode of the otherwise cute children's show The Tweenies featuring an unfortunate Jimmy Savile impersonation prompting a barrage of complaints. Hello all you teddy guys and girls out there. Oh, oh, oh. welcome well, to the... It's weird, really, if you ask me, that people complained about that, but no one said a thing when ITV's London Tonight just casually confronted viewers with footage of another risible cartoon figure wearing Jimmy Savile's hair. But we start here. For years, yellow jersey mannequin Lance Armstrong was a hero to millions. He won the Tour de France seven times, despite, as the coverage implied, having asthma and being so sick he needed constant attention from doctors. His was a fairy tale story, albeit the kind of fairy tale which starts with a hero losing a testicle to cancer. Yet throughout his career, he was dogged by rumours that he might be the cycling equivalent of a value range burger, a dumb chunk of meat containing substances of dubious origin. Rumours which, as ITN forensically revealed, were curtly dismissed whenever they were put to him. Lance Armstrong said sorry before, but only as a form of attack. I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry you can't dream big, and I'm sorry you don't believe in miracles. I believe in miracle drugs. Now, having been stripped of his jerseys, the news got to gorge on all the ghastly details of his fall from grace. According to reports in America this morning, Lance Armstrong's admitted doping during a TV interview. Jesus, doping during a TV interview? This guy had a problem. Yes, Armstrong was set to confess all to fearsome inquisitress Oprah Winfrey in an encounter that was trailed like a pay-per-view smackdown. Oprah, Lance Armstrong, no holds barred. Although the way Oprah described it to inquisitive breakfast shows made it sound less like a fight and more like an erotic encounter. At the end of it, um, two and a half, literally two and a half hours, we, we both were pretty exhausted and um, I, I would say I was satisfied. It also sounds like the interview had quite a messy climax. He did not come clean in the manner that I expected. Ugh. The interview itself was a sexless and forlorn affair in which Armstrong, visibly morphing into Tony Blair, which is what years of lying does to you, answered questions with the searing honesty of an unfeeling machine. Did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Was one of those banned substances EPO? Yes. Well done, you're through to the bonus round. Are you a crushing disappointment to millions? Yes. Correct, you've won seven pints of virgin's blood. But Armstrong wasn't totally emotionless, no. He visibly buckled when recalling how he had to tell his son that the rumours were true. I told Luke. I said... Uh, Luke, I am your father. There was also the inelegant manner in which he apologised to former friend Betsy Andrew, who he'd viciously turned on. I said, listen, I, I called you crazy. I called you a bitch. I called you all these things. But I never called you fat. You, sir, are a gentleman bully. Perhaps not surprisingly, Betsy herself appeared unimpressed when CNN delightedly relayed Lance's comments and she addressed him directly as a consequence. You owed it to me, Lance, and you dropped the ball. Oh, now let's not bring his ball into it. Still, never mind how people who actually knew him felt. Most importantly, the news wanted to know what people on or near bicycles thought about it and they quickly went about rounding up their opinions. I teach kids and, you know, the, my students have a lot of respect for him and do you reckon they respect your hat and i feel like he's not setting him a good example for the people that they mean the most to you know and that that lets me down in general oh boo-hoo you know what we hear a lot about the people lance armstrong's let down you never hear about all the liars he's inspired having exhausted the pool of people riding bicycles outdoors they moved inside asking people at bike shops what they thought of lie strong as a human being i think he's a jerk would I ride with him? Yeah, I don't care. I know plenty of jerks. 
In the wake of the negative blanket coverage of their sport, it's hard to know if cyclists will ever regain their innate dignity. So how can cyclists go forward from here? Well, by pedalling, probably. But even if bikes are a bad scene, not all sport is evil. No, some of it is good, clean fun. The Olympics were 10,000 years ago, yet the depressed population of austerity Britain still craves their feel-good glow. That's why TV's still throwing things that are sort of Olympic in your direction. Things like this. Tonight, Olympic hero Tom Daly coaches five celebrities as they dive headfirst into the most terrifying challenge of their lives. Oh. Falling doesn't get tougher than this. Yes, in what is the most unedifying example of celebrity plummeting since Rod Hull, ITV have unveiled Splash, starring the nation's favourite CGI Pixar boy, Tom Daly, seen here walking around in his pants like a bloke who's misplaced his locker key. Tom Daly is brilliant at falling into water. Most people flail their arms around and shout, Oh, shit! when they fall into water, but not Tom Daly. No, he's taught himself not to do that using mental processes. Here he is talking us through the intense drama of falling into water in the manner of someone under hypnosis recounting a previous life. When I step out poolside, I can smell the glory. I start to climb the steps. My heart is racing. I'm on the edge. My world stops. I hook the trunks out of my bum and fall into the water. <laughs> Apart from falling into water, Tom's job is to teach a group of famous and allegedly famous human beings how to plummet into water like graceful and hopefully odourless turds. At times, you sense what ITV really want to broadcast is celebrity stripping, but Ofcom said no, so they cleaned it with chlorine and put it on Saturday night. I suspect the whole thing was a TV experiment to find out if celebrities are affected by the law of gravity and whether they fall quicker if they're more famous. There's probably people around the back in lab coats writing all the findings down and passing it on to future generations. Basically, what I'm saying is Splash is increasing human wisdom by a factor of at least 40%. The falls they do are impressively complex. Sometimes they have to perform flips and turns, which is hard, and other times they have to impersonate somebody illegally dumping a dead horse in a canal, or someone who's being executed by a single gunshot to the head on the side of a dredger, which is even harder. Then it's over to the judges to decide how good they were at falling. Two of the judges are experts at falling, and one of them's Joe Brand, whose main qualification to judge a diving contest is that, like all humans, she's 98% water. Of course, the intrinsic problem is that diving does doesn't last very long. With only a few two-second money shots in a 90-minute show, the programme's forced to add more dubious filler than a Tesco value burger. That's why we're treated to underwhelming backstage VTs chronicling their belly-flopping journey and repeated slow-motion shots of each dive. In fact, it's only really enlivened by revealing questioning from Gabby Logan. Listen, getting hit in the ring must hurt. Hitting the water looks pretty painful too. What's yeah. worse? Well, that's a personal question. There are also interminable poolside street dance sequences because people in telly seem to think you can make anything seem contemporary and entertaining by drizzling a bit of f***ing street dance onto it. Seriously, the day we finally broadcast live hangings, you'll see these pricks doing this shit round the f***ing gallows. Splash is actually from Dutchland. The Dutch Anise came up with it first and their version looks exactly exactly the same, but the people falling in it are larger. And they're still sort of celebrities, but only in Dutch. And because they all speak in Dutch, it's the sort of thing that should be on BBC4, really, because it's basically the same as Borgen, but with gravity in it. Splash certainly generated some online commentary, which we'll explore now in a regular part of the show, in which we take a look at the kind of entirely reasonable things people are saying online about the issues of the day. It's your words, your mindset. Hey, it's what you think. It's points off of you in points off you. Yes, Linda Barker on the dramatic and entertaining splash. Her body raised eyebrows and generated much online noise, although not everyone was impressed. For instance, Russ from Lancashire visited the Mail Online website to say, I'm stunned by the reaction to Linda's body. What's the fuss all about? She's as straight as a plank with only a couple of fried eggs to put into that bikini of hers, that's her told. In the close-up camera shots, she looks every one of her 51 years. Russ there, apparently quite angry that a woman he doesn't know has received compliments on her physique. But I'd say you've put her firmly in her place, Russ, her 51-year-old place. Well done. Rhea from London chips in to say, she seems to be a bit of an exhibitionist. I notice she holds her arms above her head, whether it's to wave or if she's running alongside the pool. I'm guessing she does this to elongate her torso and make it look slimmer. 
Ah, well spotted, Rhea. Well, should I call you Sherlock Holmes? Yes, as you can see from this revealing footage, not only does deceptive Linda raise her arms, uh, but when she cynically jumps into the water, the waves distort the light, thereby further masking the shape of her liar's carcass. Good point, Rhea, and it's good to see women turning on each other. Finally, a real-life Barker encounter for Linda Barker fans. Hannah took to Twitter to say, I once asked Linda Barker for her autograph for a dare. She was dressed entirely in peach silk. It was 2002. Well, thanks, Hannah. A fascinating glimpse there into your life and Linda's. There was this amazing program about Africa, right? All about this country called Africa, which is why they called it that. There's always charity things saying Africa's full of starving people and you should send them your money. But that must be a con because you could see from the footage no one actually lives in Africa. It flies over for ages and there's literally no one there. And the reason no one's there is it's full of monsters. There's like sort of hairy men monsters and tall horse monsters that run around like deck chairs would if deck chairs ran. And these vagina head monsters that fight in ponds. It's really frightening. I'm glad it's miles away. Normally, animals are in zoos where people give them a sense of purpose by throwing nuts at them and watching them do tricks. But because there's no people left in Africa, the animals have gone mad. Like, the elephants attack each other with their mouth sticks and the tall horse monsters have these head fighting competitions that look like they'd filmed Rocky inside two giraffes by mistake. It was a bit with a monkey and his bum was a state, right? It was all ragged. He looked like he'd been shitting, I don't know, metal hexagons or something to get an arsehole that torn up. But there's no doctors in the jungle, so he has to just walk around with it like that. It's so bleak. You can tell the animals are depressed. Some of them are just smashing stuff up. Some of them can't eat anymore, you know. Some of them can't hack it, so they just lie around. There was this gazelle that had hung itself. It'd show you amazing things you didn't know, like how gazelles can float and how baby ostriches dance to music. And now when a cricket falls on the floor, it makes a massive noise like it's made of metal. Just like how Who Framed Roger Rabbit had all the cartoons in it, this had all the animals, all the famous animals, rammed in together so the personalities clash in the jungle like I'm a Celebrity. And they eat horrible things too, just like I'm a Celebrity, but they don't mind if they taste of animals because they're already animals, so they can't taste it. They nicked all this other stuff from reality shows. Like, they have infrared night camera, like on Big Brother, so you can see what they do at night when they've been drinking. He may have style, but he's turning out to be something of a disappointment. It's incredible what you learn. Like, I discovered that no matter how majestic and incredible nature is, if my phone beeps, I can just ignore Africa and check my text without even thinking. So really, if the environment goes to shit and all those animals die, you know, I think I'll be able to carry on. In the wake of recent massacres, America has been asking itself searching questions about its apparent addiction to guns. There are now so many tragic mass shootings, they actually air public information films telling you how to survive. I'm not making this up. It may feel like just another day at the office. But occasionally, life feels more like an action movie than reality. This helpful video, which looks a bit like the most harrowing episode of the American office ever made, teaches you how to react if a man with a shotgun goes berserk in your workplace. Apparently, you should run. If you can't run, you should hide. And if you can't hide, well... And commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. <laughs> Graceful. Look at that, there's four of them and only one of him. Cowards! Looking at this, it's little wonder the calls for tighter gun controls are growing louder. Well, they have to be loud to be heard over the constant sound of gunfire and screaming. It's a hot-button issue that's livened up Piers Morgan's CNN show considerably as pro-gun guests turn up to shout at him. And I'm here to tell you, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. Doesn't... The whole thing's become a sort of interactive game show where the viewer has to decide who the biggest prick is. I don't know, is it the shouty prick or the slimy prick? I just don't know. This week, thousands marched on Washington to call for stricter gun control. We will not step back! I wish you would. I can hear you from here. And I'm in Britain. 
But gun control faces an uphill struggle because some sections of US society seem to love guns more than their own children and they feel under threat. If only gun owners had some means of defending themselves. Fox News did their bit for trigger lovers with a QVC-style rundown of some of the most popular killing machines on the market, showcased by a hot markswoman, seen here demonstrating the type of gun used in the Sandy Hook massacre. Probably one of the most popular rifles in the US right now, thanks to all the media attention. Yeah, you know what? I don't know that the media coverage has made it popular with everyone. Everyone says it's so big and scary, but that's simply... These are cosmetic features that have no bearing on the firearms functions at all. Although, just to be clear, those firearms functions will kill you. My five-year-old nephew uh, harvested his first deer about a month ago with my competition rifle, and he was able to make this fit him. There you go. So simple a child could use it, but not outrun it. Still, the young guns do start young in the US, and their guns aren't quite so cosmetically terrifying as Five News graphically demonstrated. This one is pinky. It's my pink. 22 AR-15. And then this one is Pinkalicious, my pink 22 chambered pistol. But not all kids like guns. In emotive scenes on CNN, Obama announced his plans for gun control, flanked by children who'd contacted him to ask him to do something. You know, in the letter that uh, Julia wrote me, she said, I know that laws have to be passed by Congress, but I beg you to try very hard. Julia, I will try very hard. Oh, brave move, resurrecting the Jim will fix it format in this day and age. The National Rifle Association also uses kids in the row, as in this bullish advert, accusing Obama of hypocrisy because his children have armed guards. Are the president's kids more important than yours? Uh, yeah. Charismatic NRA spokesman Wayne Lapierre also did his bit in a startling speech in which he claimed the only way to stop gun massacres in schools was to put more guns in schools because... The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So what you're saying is, when the bad guy turns the gun on himself, he becomes a good guy and dies a hero. He also blamed old computer games. Vicious, violent video games with names like Bulletstorm, Grand Theft Auto, Mortal Kombat, and Splatterhouse. Although for some reason this NRA spokes twat failed to mention certain games which had the news exercising their right to be up in arms. The National Rifle Association has taken the controversial step of launching its own video game. Yes, NRA practice range is intended to teach youngsters to shoot and it's not the only NRA game. A few years back they released this, NRA Varmint Hunter, which encourages the player to bravely murder unarmed critters like a big brave hero. Quick, it poses no threat, kill it! Hero! Looking at all of that, it's hard to work out why anyone would want to even live in America anymore. Well, here's someone who does. It's US comedian and drunk Doug Stanhope. He's going to convince you that the USA is great, apparently. I'm Doug Stanhope, and that's why I drink. America is fucking great. And it really is. I know you don't want to hear this from me, but that's the truth. Brits love to bitch about America and they love to hate America. The government and the wars and the torture. But that's not life here. Come on. Life in America is actually fantastic. Everything works. Come here. I want you to be here. Just get a non-stop from Heathrow. Go directly to Florida. Walk down that ramp and tell me if you can't immediately sense something's really good here. Rent a car. Get a convertible. Fill up the tank. Look at the price. Fucking $11 a gallon over there. Look at the price. You're going to fill up your tank. You're going to fill up the back seat as well. Just because just it's that fucking cheap comparatively. Drive down big empty highways drive to the beach there'll be a half a dozen cabana bars open it's only eight o'clock in the morning and they, they're waving at you they're smiling at you and they're waving for you to come on in they want you to be there because they don't know yet that you don't tip come on in come on in <laughs> have a seat at the bar she's gonna hand you a big breakfast menu it's this big you know what we have for traditional american breakfast choices yeah, lots of choices. You want some eggs? How do you want them done? We can do them 10 different ways. You want French toast? You want waffle? Pancakes? We have chocolate chip pancakes. They'll put a, a whipped cream smiley face right on there for your fucking British ass. Or maybe you want a whipped cream frowny face to match that dour expression. 
You're still trying to fight liking it here. Order a cocktail, and she's gonna do something you've never seen before. She's gonna pour it like this, and she's gonna go up and down, and she keeps pouring it. How can this possibly be right? In the UK, when you order a mixed drink, some scientist pops out of the floorboards in a lab coat, and he's a system of weights and measures, and a fucking stainless steel cylinder that assures that you will not get any more, even the vapors of more than one measured ounce in your fucking $15 cocktail. Life here is really fucking good. Yeah, we have a lot of dumb people here, but you can afford to be dumb here. Everything makes sense. You're lost, you don't know where you are. You're, where are you? 77th Street? Go a block. You know what's next? 78th Street! It makes sense. You don't have to think. It's not like your roads that are all crisscross and mishmash and they're all built 1,100 years ago for donkeys and carts and you don't know where the hell you are or where you're going. Hitler did his best to help the UK and level that country flat so they could start over like extreme country makeover. And what did the Brits do? They spat in Hitler's face and built it back brick by brick exactly the way it was 1100 years ago when it didn't make sense. Come to America, you can stay on my couch. If you don't like it after a week, I'll give you your money back. My God, amazing. Uh, now here's something else that may or may not be amazing. I don't know, I haven't seen it. It's just a generic link. It starts now. The original Django movie was an ultra-violent spaghetti western so full of this kind of carnage it was banned in Britain for many years. Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained, however, is an outrageous action movie set against the laugh-a-minute backdrop of slavery. <laughs> Hello, you poor devils. It stars Jamie Foxx as the eponymous Django, a slave freed and mentored by the idiosyncratic bounty hunter Dr. King Schultz. After making money in the bad guy shooting industry, Django and Schultz set out to rescue Django's missing wife Broomhilda from the clutches of racist shitbag Leonardo DiCaprio and his uncle Tom Housemaster, played by Samuel L. Jackson, disguised as Uncle Ben of Three Minute Rice fame. You're scaring me. Why is I'm scaring you? Maybe she's racist. Django plays fast and loose with anything resembling facts in a similar vein to Inglorious Bastards, which also ran around with a history book on its head farting the A-Team theme tune. Like Bastards, Django is both grim and hilarious and contains both the tensest and funniest moments you'll see on a cinema screen this year, and a bit where a naked man has his penis shot off. You had my curiosity, but now you have my attention. Basically, it makes slavery worth it. Joining me now to talk about Django are stand-up Susan Kalman and human fact factory Richard Osman from Pointless, who has slaves himself. <laughs> I do, yeah, I do. So this is the second film in a row where Tarantino has basically driven a bus through quite a sensitive topic. Because, I mean, in Glorious Bastards it was Nazis, uh, this time it's slavery. I thought it was yeah. great. I mean, it's the same film as Inglorious Bastards. It's identical. I was really pleasantly surprised how much I laughed in it as mm. well. It's a, a film about slavery, but it's funny about slavery. But you know what? Genuinely, on a serious point, mm. he's made a film about slavery that people are going to go and watch. It's actually quite recent past, and you do forget what happened. Yes, so but, you, I mean, come on. It's not exactly a, a, a watertight historical document. This, no, but then, but, OK, so Spielberg made Amistad, and, you know, that's a proper, almost sort of documentary-style, mm. uh, you know, Very reverential, of, of slavery. But, yeah. Exactly. But, you know, I haven't watched it. Yeah. So Amistad is a worthy film, is what you're basically saying. You wouldn't go and see a worthy film about slavery, but you'll go and see a cartoon where a, lot of, where a man gets his penis well, I, shot Well, I'm off. not going to see a film about slavery, essentially. I'm going to see a t Quentin yeah. Tarantino film, as are lots of people. And you know what? It made me think about you slavery don't for... Care it made about me slaves? Wow. Oh, Whoa. Yes. Whoa. It sounds Gosh, a bit like you don't really care exactly. about slavery. What you're saying yeah. is, I'll care about slavery if you throw in enough people having it's their penises shut off way. to amuse me. Me yeah. the king. Like, amuse me. <laughs> yeah. Come on. I demand entertainment before I'll even remember your <laughs> suffering. Afterwards, I thought for 45 to 50 seconds about slavery. <laughs> which is, thought about which it I, before. Which I wouldn't have done. And also across the country, lots of people thinking for yeah. 45 seconds about slavery, and that all adds up. There's been a lot of talk about the amount of violence um, in the film and in, in films in general. There's a particular shootout in it where there's a guy he uses as a kind of human shield who just explodes like a bag of blood. And I was, I was kind of helpless with laughter at that. Is that because I'm unhinged or, or, or what? Why, yeah. wasn't, why wasn't the violence <laughs> disturbing? Well, it's not disturbing. I wouldn't say it's hilarious. It wasn't, you know, top ten comedy moments, Dale Boy mm -hmm. falling through a bar. 
laughter. <laughs> but uh, it was funny in that it was quite cartoonish. There was so much at one point. Mm. It was like someone throwing red paint at the screen. There's a lot of blood. Whoever's in yeah, charge of the blood, of blood did a really good job. Yeah. Having done the Nazis <laughs> yeah. and made the Nazis fun, and having done slavery and made slavery fun, what could Tarantino possibly tackle next? I'd like to see him doing the suffragettes. When you say doing the suffragettes, what do you <laughs> well, mean? Well, not him exactly? doing Holding the suffragettes. Them down? I would like a, to see Tarantino's take upon the suffragette movement because they were actually quite violent, some of the suffragettes. Were uh, they, they blew up churches and also it was quite vicious the way they, they force fed them through the mouth and also tried to feed them through the anus. That they, they force fed suffragettes through the anus? Through the anus. That's absolutely true. That's not biologically possible. Well, surely, they didn't know a lot in those days, though. I'm not saying one would do it now. One wouldn't force feed a woman through the anus now. <laughs> it honestly feels to me this discussion is, is for the red button. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining me. It's time to end this bit, which I've done really smoothly like that. Thank Go away. Sure. Now we're going to look at this. Excitement in the USA as President Barack Obama is sworn in as President of the United States. The Office of President of the United States. The Office of President of the United States. And Demonstrating far better control of her lips, popular songstress and bum owner Beyonce rounded off the spectacle by belting out the national anthem. But then controversy, as some claimed Beyonce had lip-synced the words, and a fierce debate broke out across the news channels as everyone debated whether this was right or wrong, or even mattered. Did she fake it? And if so, why should we care? Still, whether live or pre-recorded, there's no denying Beyonce makes a sweeter sound than Mr. President ever will. I mean, Beyonce can hit a pitch-perfect high note. The best Obama can do is let out a sort of ugly drone that kills everyone in the village. <laughs> Royalty! And as Lord Harrington Wales completes his tour of duty, Sky News treats us to an intimate tour of beauty, as we saw just what he's been up to down Soldier Town Way. When not machine-gunning shepherds from the skies, Harry's job seems to largely consist of dressing up as Pippi Longstocking and playing FIFA on the PlayStation. Surprised he's got a PlayStation, I'd have thought he'd use a Royal Wii. <laughs> I'm one of those people that love playing PlayStation and Xbox, um, so with my thumbs, I like to think that I'm probably quite useful. Harry's apparently flippant comparison between killing the Taliban and playing a video game didn't go down that brilliantly. Still, it's hard to fathom what people thought he was doing in Afghanistan, since Apache helicopters are a bit killy, as is army life in general, which is why he's got so much fearsome equipment. This is really just a flying gun, and he's in charge of it. He's got a big cannon under his cockpit, a handgun on his waist and a terrifying four-colour Bic pen strapped to his shoulder. He can write in red, green, blue or black. Take that, Taliban. Actually, Harry spent most of the interview complaining more about the media than the Taliban. God knows why he hates the press so much. I mean, all they've done is hack his brother's voicemail, print photos of his bum, call him a Nazi and be implicated in the tragic death of his mother when he was 12 years old. I mean, get over it. Although, to be fair, the media do get things wrong. Sky News don't even seem to know his name. They think he's called Andy. Andy. Andy's off, away from the cameras and the questions. Captain Wales runs back to the life he's come to love. Oh, sorry, I forgot you were still there. Uh, that's about all we've got time for this week. We'll see you next week. Until then, go away. Go away.